Okay, tonight we're going to start uh, the evening with a uh, public hearing. Public hearing on Texas Annual Performance <coughs> Report. I've asked Dr. Nell to present information on that report. And if anybody has any comments, when he's complete with the report, if you'll come to the podium and state your name. And if you'll keep your comments to a couple of minutes, we'd appreciate it. So this time I'll turn it over to Dr. Nell. Well, good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Stockton and our community. We are thankful that you're here tonight. Uh, we're able to make it through the weather and hopefully uh, everyone came out through that cold snap okay. Uh, it's an honor to be here tonight to present our annual performance report to you. Um, it's a culmination of many different reports and I'll share that with you, but really what it is is a picture of hard work. Uh, we have great people in Conroe ISD that work very hard uh, to make sure that our students can be successful. And many of them are here tonight. I see a lot of our uh, staff members and principals and assistant principals here. So if all of our Connor ISD staff members that are, that are here tonight, that are on campuses, that work with our students each day, if you would stand up so we could recognize you uh, before we do this presentation. Thank you all for being here and, and doing what you do every day. Uh, as part of our annual performance report tonight, we're going to be looking at data that comes from many reports, um, mostly from our TAPER, that's the Texas Academic Performance Report. Um, TAPERs are available for all school districts across the state uh, and each campus. So you can go in uh, directly to TEA's website and see this information, or you can go to the Conroe ISD website and we have it there for you as well. We also will be looking at some PEAMS uh, financial data uh, as well as uh, criminal incidents and our um, report on our graduates that are attending Texas um, public higher learning institutions. Overall, our accountability rating on the taper was met standard, which is the highest that it could be. And our special education um, determination status was meets requirements. When you look at our enrollment, we continue to grow each year. Um, last year, our official enrollment uh, was 59,489 students. Just as a note, today's enrollment in the district um, as of this morning is 61,580. We actually enrolled almost 800 students last week. <laughs> yes, last week, 800. Now, we did also lose some. Some students moved away, but our, our registrars enrolled 800 students last week. And this is our student membership, just our demographic information as it appears in the taper. Part of the process of, of, that we choose to do as we present our taper uh, is to show some context. We like to benchmark, benchmark ourselves uh, against some other high performing districts in the area. And so as we go through our performance reports here, you're going to see uh, that we include both uh, SciFair, Fort Bend, Humble, Katie, and Klein, uh, as well as our information. So this first slide, uh, all students, how do they perform on the STAR? You can see we were at 85%. All students, all subjects, master's grade level. This is, would have been the old commended um, performance level. All students, all subjects met or exceeded. Our English language learners, um, how did they perform at approaches grade level or above? Did they pass? You can see we were at 59%. Special education students, 48%. Our economically disadvantaged students, how did they perform at approaches grade level and master's grade level? Attendance rate, 96.4. Um, I believe this is the highest attendance rate that maybe we've ever had. Uh, here's just a, a chart showing the last few years. Th this is uh, a reflection of a lot of hard work that goes on on campuses. There's a lot of phone calls being made uh, when students aren't present. Um, and it's just reflective of a, a great learning environment when kids want to be present at school. You know, there is a ceiling to this number, and I'm not sure exactly what it is, but there's a point where, uh, and 100% is not it, Right. Students will be sick and will not be available to be at school on a given day. And we don't want them to be at school if, the, if they are sick. So, you know, there is a ceiling. It may be at 97, 97. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but 
I think we're, we're getting close to it. So this is great. In our current year to date, uh, as of today, we're at 96.4 for this year as well. So we, we're maintaining that. This is a slide we're real proud of. Um, culmination of hard work from pre-K all the way through the high schools um, to have our dropout rate be the lowest on, of, of all these districts that we look at. We would love for this to be at zero. We all understand and recognize that, but we want to continue to bring this down as low as we can. Included in the taper, um, they'll, they'll give us a snapshot of our uh, most recent graduating classes and how they perform, and they'll give us a five-year picture and a six-year picture because not all students um, are finished in four years. Some are still working to complete high school. So you can see here our class of 2015 five-year um, cohort. You can see it five years, 97.4% had graduated. And we, we talk about that often. We talk about those continuers, right? And, and how do you, those kids that don't quite make it, um, for May graduation, but can we get them to come back? Will you, will you come back? And when they come back, can we convert them to graduates? And we've done a, a very nice job of doing that. And this is our four-year cohort of our 2016. So there are those students, they're the continuers, the 2.3%, and hopefully by the time we see this information next year, we will have converted those to graduates. Once again, we push all of our students to take the recommended plan or distinguished uh, achievement program. We want, it's our expectation that students will take um, the most rigorous curriculum in their high school career. Our students have two opportunities to earn college credit in high school. Uh, one is our great dual credit program uh, that works with Lone Star College. And the other way is um, more of a national program that's advanced placement. The students take a college level course uh, within their high school at the conclusion of the course they take an exam and if they make a passing score on the exam then they earn college credit so you can see we had 36.8 percent of our students taking AP exams that number continues to increase uh, and we're all proud of that number we, we want students to, to take that opportunity to challenge themselves in the classroom and then our, our students are scoring above criterion there at 64 percent that's a strong number and and this slide can be a little misleading based on um, philosophical differences within districts. You know, a student can take an AP course and then not choose to take the test at the end of the course. And that's not uncommon. So you may have a student that's taking six AP courses in their high school and they decide, you know what, I, I don't have time to prepare for all six of these exams because they're all kind of within a two week window. Uh, I think I'll just take three of them instead of taking all six. Well, we encourage and Conrad's to our students to take all of those exams because we think there is a benefit for, for sitting for that exam even if they don't make the passing score. And so that may be reflected in our number here, but we do think that's important. This reflects a number of our students that took the SAT or ACT college uh, entrance exams last year. And then how well they performed. We like to put our academic success uh, in context. Uh, you know, we have two great charges as a public um, school institution. One is to provide a great education. The second is to be great stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. And the uh, FAST report annually um, looks at exactly that. It, it rates schools on how they perform academically and how they perform financially. And you can see that we are one of only three districts of the over um, 1,000 school districts in the state of Texas that have received all five stars for six consecutive years of the program. And then that's reflected here. Um, once again, with these, these same school districts, you look at total tax rate, we're at $1.28, um, which is well below any of the other districts that we uh, compared with so well uh, performance-wise. A few financial slides here just that and I'll, I'll point out a, a few highlights as we go through we're very proud of the first number that 60.9 percent of our budget goes to instruction um, you know being over four points higher than the state uh, 
we want to make sure that we're investing our resources in the classroom with our students. Uh, also, as you go down, different things that you may notice is that we uh, almost half a point higher in guidance and counseling. We believe in counselors. Uh, we have counselors uh, in all of our schools. We actually added a counselor a few years ago at each of our high schools. Um, we do believe in the great work that they do. Also, health services. We have an, a nurse at each one of our campuses. Transportation continues to be um, an expense for us. We are a very large school district and our buses travel many miles per day. So we are uh, well above the state in transportation expenses. When you look at our staff overall, you could notice um, our percent of staff in central administration. We run a very small central administration uh, here in Conroe ISD. And on the last slide, you may notice that just general administration, uh, our costs are much lower than the state. We also report uh, annually our criminal incidents. You know, we have great students in Conroe ISD. You know, over 61,000 students come to school. Uh, 170 this year, this past year, 178 days. That's uh, almost 11 million school days. Um, but occasionally students make a bad choice um, and, and find themselves in a little bit of trouble. And so we did have 57 reportable criminal incidents last year. Um, 36 of those were felony controlled substance and a majority of those are coming straight out of mom and dad's medicine cabinet at home. It continues to be our number one incident. It's prescription drugs um, that students are bringing from home. Additionally, a student may get in trouble uh, at another district and then move into Connor ISD and then it still shows up uh, on our report. So that, that I know that's the case with at least one of them on our report this year. When our students uh, go out and attend Texas public four year and two year uh, schools, we are able to retrieve some data back on them. Uh, and so that's always very helpful. So you can see that we had uh, 1,718 students attending those colleges and universities. And let's see how they did. <clears throat> well, a strong majority of them have done very well. Um, you can see the, the 2.5 GPA and above is a strong majority of our students. So they, they are well prepared when they get to college and they're performing at a high level. Um, 355 of those students are getting <clears throat> fired up and they're going to do better next semester. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> if they get the chance, I'm sure. <laughs> That's the challenge. But the slides that I presented tonight, in addition to our complete district taper and, and our district annual report that has very in-depth information on uh, each campus all the way down through AP scores, all of that is available on our website. Um, and like I said, you can also go to TEA's website and pull a variety of information um, about not only our school district, but any school district in the state. Great. Thank you, Dr. Noll. At this time, I'll ask anyone who has any comments to please come to the podium. And if you'll state your name and make your comment, we'd appreciate it. Okay, seeing no takers, that uh, concludes our uh, public hearing. Thank you. Call this meeting in the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Government Code, Texas Opens Meetings Act, Chapter 551. The time is now 613. All right. Please uh, stand with me while Mr. Kidd leads us in the invocation and Mr. Williams in the pledges. If you would like to, uh, please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, we just uh, praise you and we thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon this community and this school district. Dear God, specifically tonight, we want to just lift up the family of, of Larry Moore and the whole Moorhead Junior High family and give them, Lord, the comfort and peace that only you can provide. Just be with them and thank you for his service to CISD and, and the legacy that he's left. Dear God, we also specifically uh, thank you God for the, the principals, the assistant principals, the staff and, and all of the, the CISD employees here tonight. Lord, for, for just their support, uh, for their uh, energy, their dedication. 
And dear God, just be with them for this school year and just uh, uh, help them and guide and direct them in their everyday uh, positions and how they impact our children. Lord, thank you so much for them. Dear God, again, just uh, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to serve on this board. Uh, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your direction uh, so that we may glorify you and, and serve the students in our district. Dear God, we also just ask for your uh, blanket of protection over our children who uh, return to school tomorrow and for the rest of the school year for all of those, Lord, uh, in our district. Just uh, thank you for this time together tonight. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Williams, Mr. Kidd. Um, item 2A, Special District Recognition, Dr. Stockton. Hi, I'm very excited to, tonight. Um, just excited, period. Um, excited we're going to be in school tomorrow, by the way. Um, I'm excited tonight to ask Tasha Smith to come in, come up to the podium and share some comments about our appreciation for our wonderful school board. Tasha? Good evening. President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it is my honor to represent our Conroe ISD administrators, educators, staff members, and students to thank each and every one of you for all that you do for the Conroe Independent School District. Daily, you demonstrate strength and dedication as you focus on excellence for CISD communities, teachers, staff members, and most importantly, our students. You unselfishly contribute your time and talents toward the advancement of our schools and the students we serve. You are extraordinary individuals who have voluntarily tackled the enormous job of governing our school district. Although January has been dedicated as School Board Appreciation Month, please know that we are thankful for all that you do every day. Our students have demonstrated their appreciation by providing the cards, posters, banners, small gifts, drawings, and candy that you see here tonight. Please accept these tokens of our appreciation for our leadership, support, and the numerous hours you give to make our district the outstanding place that it truly is to live, to work, and to go to school. It is with your leadership that you are helping to ensure that our students graduate with confidence and competence to do whatever they wish. I ask all the attendees tonight to join with me in a round of applause to honor and thank the CISD Board of Trustees for their hard work, dedication, and commitment to creating a bright future for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Item 2B. Ms. Godfrey, has anyone signed up to speak to the board? <coughs> All right. Item 3 is the consent agenda. I've had a request to remove item G to discuss. Uh, so without any other, do I have a motion to approve? Motion to accept the uh, consent agenda as presented with the exception of item G. Second the motion. All in favor? All right. Item 3G is receive and consider adoption of local policies included in local policy manual update 109. And Mr. Moore, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I would just um, like to request a little bit more information um, about this item. Um, just uh, some general background information is the reasoning uh, why we're suggesting reducing the waiver period from 30 to 15 days. And do we have any figures as, even if it's just approximate, I'm not asking for specific to the cent, but um, ballpark as to how much it costs the district in unpaid lunch money every month? Uh, sure, I'll try to answer that question. Um, <clears throat> first, a little background. That's a relatively new policy. I think it just went in a few months ago. And then when it did, we just made up a day of, of, of 30 days, kind of as a timeline. And after we've gotten into it, what we've learned is that we probably need to shorten that. We've checked what other districts do. and. 
Um, the reason we want to shorten it is because we have found that when we start having conversations with families, oftentimes they end up applying for and qualifying for free and reduced lunch. So the sooner we start having those conversations, the better. Um, and so that's really our motive behind it. It doesn't change anything, the fact that we're committed to serving our students meals each and every day. Um, that's really a policy about when we start um, having those formal conversations with families about that. Uh, to date, we're averaging uh, probably a little bit over $15,000 a month about what we're not collecting in lunches that we're serving. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Motion to approve. I second the motion. All right. All those in favor? Motion passes. Item uh, 4A, we're actually going to uh, take a moment and have a public hearing. So for the moment, we are in recess, and the time is now 620. Okay, at this time, we're going to have our second public hearing of the night. I'm going to ask Debbie Phillips uh, to come up and present the uh, public hearing for the turnaround plan for Sam Houston Elementary School. Thank you. Good evening, President Bush, Dr. Stockton, members of the board. Um, I'm here this evening to present the turnaround plan for Sam Houston Elementary. But before I get started, I have to acknowledge the incredible leadership team that are here tonight. Uh, Viviana Harris, our, our new principal over there, Viviana Phil Stans, doing a fantastic job. <laughs> and then we also have our two assistant principals, Gabe Hernandez and Teresa Waller as well. We are really proud of, of the job that they're doing. They're really digging in and, and getting after it. We're starting to see some great results. But I'd like to start the evening with reviewing um, the uh, timeline for Houston's improvement required process, because it can be confusing. In August of 2017, the final accountability results were released, and Houston Elementary received a second year improvement required rating. In September of 2017, um, you approved the targeted improvement plan for Houston Elementary. Um, today, January 8, 2018, um, we are here for uh, your approval for the Houston turnaround plan. In August, we're going to be anxiously awaiting the final accountability results. And uh, when Houston Elementary receives a, a MET standard rating, you will then be required to decide if you want the turnaround plan to be implemented, if you want the turnaround plan to be modified, or if you want it to be discontinued. If you decide to implement this plan that I present to you tonight, it will begin in August and it will continue over the next two years. So it's not to be confused, when a school receives an improvement required rating two years in a row, there are two plans. The first plan Houston developed was the targeted improvement <coughs> plan. And it's a very comprehensive plan that targets the areas of need, and you approved it in September. The plan included three major strategies, and here they are just for your, um, just to remind you. One strategy was to utilize the professional learning community approach um, to, for planning time and resources to generate quality questions for effective guided reading. The school's been working on guided reading for the past two years. Um, the second strategy was to utilize effective conferring and writer's workshop to guide future instruction. And then you'll recall the third strategy was to utilize professional learning community planning time and resources to appropriately plan for small group math instruction. So that was all of the, the, the um, targeted improvement plan that you approved earlier. So tonight I'm bringing for your approval the second plan, Houston's turnaround plan. This plan was developed by Houston's core team, an outside school improvement professional that we've been working with. Uh, we had a lot of district support, um, uh, district coaches and uh, district um, CNI team, and then also a representative from Region 6 gave input as well. We consulted with a TEA representative and then also solicited feedback from parents. So the purpose of the turnaround plan is to develop a systemic approach to producing significant and sustainable gains and achievement and to, and to get a MET standard rating within two years of implementation. The plan must include an initiative that impacts all grade levels and all teachers and it will be required to be implemented for the next two years. 
The uh, initiative that Sam Houston is adopting for this turnaround plan is that of instructional rounds. And some of you have heard about that. This was also the um, turnaround uh, plan for Austin Elementary, and they've had a lot of success with that. And so I know the Houston teachers are excited to, to implement that as well at their school. And you'll recall it's similar to medical rounds. Uh, teachers, it's a process of teachers going into classrooms and learning from each other. Uh, administrators are not present during the, the rounds. Um, the purpose is to grow instructional practices and there's a lead teacher selected, typically an instructional coach, who facilitates small groups of teachers in these rounds. Um, the rounds are going to be focused on a common objective, something that's already in their plan. For example, questioning and guided reading, conferring and writing, or possibly small group math. The teachers go in and observe each other teaching, and then they debrief together on the observation. And ultimately, this process will enhance teachers' pedagogical skills and develop a culture of collaboration. After the rounds, after teachers are observing, they identify and they discuss effective practices that they, that they observed. Um, they talk about things that they're already using in their classroom that they noticed. Uh, they'll talk about um, practices that they currently use, but they're going to re-examine in light of what they observed. And then they'll also uh, discuss practices that they don't currently use, but they're willing to try after they've seen people use it well. And so here's where our campus and district coaches come in to support teachers as they uh, start to use these new practices. So that's the Houston uh, turnaround plan. It's wondering if there's any questions or comments. At this time, if anyone from the audience would like to make a comment, if you'll come to the podium and uh, make your comment, state your name and make your comment, we'd appreciate that. Okay, that ends our public hearing, and I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Bush. All right, so our board meeting reconvenes at 626, and item 4A is the resolution to adopt the turnaround plan for Houston Elementary. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Any question? I noticed the turnaround plan is, is more internally focused. Yes. Have we started to take consideration to external factors, community involvement, parental involvement? Has any efforts been put into seeing how much of an impact that would have as far as the success of the district, not the district, but that specific, that specific school? I think, Viviana, would you mind coming and just addressing that, please? Hey. Um, so in order to get our community involved um, what we do what we do is put up, we put out newsletters to all of our parents every weekly every week um, and encourage them to come up and um, volunteer in any way possible um, we've noticed that we don't have a lot of success with that mm -hmm. so then what we've done is we call parents one-to-one -one and have them um, have conferences with us um, we go our myself and our two APs go to car rider lines and start meeting parents mm. and let ourselves known. Um, we've gone to houses um, to just, if they need anything, how can we help them support um, their students? So it's not only about yeah. the turnaround plan, but it is about the whole community. Because we notice that a lot of times our parents um, don't know how to read or write and are really uh, afraid to come to school. So we make ourselves available um, for them. We call them. We talk to parents. We talk to kids. We talk to community members. So um, what we have is we, have, we don't have a lot of parent support, but we do have a lot of community support through our churches, through our volunteers, um, and everybody that kind of comes and, and helps out with our campuses. Mm -hmm. um, and we have noticed a lot of success awesome. um, in that. In Would that you point. also share your mentor program, please? Sure. So we have a mentor program um, that comes, there's two different mentor programs that happen. One is with our community. Um, so some of you know Gail Drummond, and she's part of that community uh, outreach that comes and helps of our kids. Um, and we have things like Girls on the Run that um, they come and help out. Uh, they come with readers um, that help that out, you know, help out as well. 
We also have a mentor program where our educators are taking on a child. So each one of our teachers, our staff members, myself, our leadership team, everybody on campus, every adult has a child that they see uh, and they mentor every week. And so that, I'm um, not every week, every month. Um, so that we make sure that we are hitting every critical student for whatever their need is. Because some kids may need academic, mm -hmm. but some kids just Emotional. need, um, a, a, yeah, and a social emotional connection as well. Phenomenal. All right, I know you guys are doing an outstanding job over there, Viviana. We have a rapport with you guys, so, mm -hmm. so great job. And uh, I just want to make sure that we're not just, you know, looking internally. We're focused on some of those external factors that could be heavily influencing some of our successes as well as some of our shortcomings. So, yes. so great job. And, yes. and that, what you've just described is outstanding as relates to making that happen as far as a community effort as opposed to a standalone school. Thank you. Thank you. If you would stay, I have another question. Okay. Though. <laughs> and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Okay. But to add on, I was right on target with Mr. Williams' comments. I'm concerned about more than just our students, although I'm concerned about Sam Houston and our students, but our family there. The mm -hmm. families, as you mentioned, those that cannot read or are, are academically are not able to many times help their children at night with homework. What can we as a board, uh, two questions. One, the first one, I'll give you, I'll give you the questions and give you a chance to respond. But what can we as a board do to help support those efforts? I understand legally we're not responsible for educating adults, but morally I believe we are responsible for educating those adults as well. So one question is what can we as a board uh, do? The second one is maybe there's something else in the community we can connect with. Maybe it's through Mr. Chavez or somewhere out there that we can connect with community support where we can try to begin offering in addition to everything we're doing through curriculum and instruction and the professional learning communities and everything else in the schools, outside the schools in the evenings to help those families better help their students at night. So I'm just looking for, for things that you can, I, I'm retired now and I've got time. So <laughs> Come on over. <laughs> he, he has been rubbing that in. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Our door is open at 730. <laughs> um, I, I I, I feel like right do something. That is a great question, and actually, we've I've I've actually thought about that a lot, and, and how we can get um, our community members more involved. Um, and in that, have come up with you know we've kind of looked at the love and logic um, and how we can get that on our campus, and we've actually started the wheels turning on that, um, and also just being able to offer classes. Um, I know that in a former school that I was still in the district, um, they offered ESL classes through mm -hmm. region, I think it was six, um, that would come and do classes for our, our community um, and things like that. So not something I have looked into, but well, something that sure. I have always had, you know, in the back of my mind on how we can um, support our parents and just what are the, what are the questions that we asked students when they're reading, um, you know, books to be able to give to them to be able to read at night. Um, math has changed a lot since our parents went to school. Um, and then just being able to support them in that aspect. We do do some nights um, like that, which are called our Title I nights. And we, um, our teachers are great about putting out the information and things like that. But that's usually about three nights a year. And really what um, I would like to do is more consecutive nights that they could come and kind of do the skill and then come back and we could tell them what's next. Mm -hmm. So when looking at that, it's really trying to teach them how to better support their mm -hmm. students right. at home. In partnership with the local churches and religious mm -hmm. organizations is always a good avenue. For yes. that. Isn't, so, isn't, yeah. isn't one of your churches in your local area teaching English to, to uh, parents? I believe at their church, I'm not quite sure. The, I, I'm not positive about that, so I don't know. Ms. Drummond's church. I am, <laughs> I am and, and, and we, need to, we need to get you okay. on the same page so you can direct them. Yes, because that would be lovely, yes. Ms. Drummond's church does, but it's not in your neighborhood, so. And, that's, <laughs> and I'm not trying to add to your load. Please understand. No. Oh, no, no, please, <laughs> please. I, and this might sound a little crazy, but... Um, 
so I take on the whole child and mm -hmm. that child comes with parents Absolutely. and yep. families and everything else so um, when I became um, a principal that was something that I just knew that um, was done for me as a child in or as a student in CISD and I promised myself that that's what I would do for the students wherever I was so that's not something that I don't mind I don't mind taking that on that is absolutely something that I would love to do well, we appreciate all your job thank yeah. you no I, have, I have an entire family yes. I have a more. question I'll address to, to both of you here mm -hmm. um, the plan um, seems to place a lot of perhaps additional work on mm -hmm. instructional coaches um, happen to know a little bit about what instructional coaches do on yes. a <laughs> campus it's not involved under a plan like this mm -hmm. um, are there any staffing or funding issues that need to be raised to be able to make this a workable plan are we in, in danger of overworking instructional coaches I'm sure no no principal would ever turn down extra money or people. <laughs> would never turn down um, extra money. <laughs> is, there, is there any request along those lines that comes along with this plan? I mean, you, you, you have to answer, answer now. Maybe you guys can get back with us yeah. as to what, you, what your expectations are and uh, any assistance that we well, may be able to provide. I think Ms. Yeah, I will, I will say that. Viviana has asked specifically for different uh, types of, of staffing and we have met those okay. requests so she wanted somebody in particular to help support <laughs> behavior and so that was provided this year um, extra tutoring so things that may have been on the coaches back are taken off okay. of the coaches okay. so that they're allowed to you know do what they do best and that's work with teachers Wonderful. I, I know all the all the administrators in here which is probably a lot of the room and I certainly know this board knows it but you know you're one of those special ones that when dr stockton calls you leave your high performing school and you come over here and fix this one and so i'd just like to give you a personal shout out to thank you, thank you for that because uh because you you had it made over here and you left <laughs> we're getting there we're getting there <laughs> thank you mr Hutchins, thank you for mentioning that i was going to interject that one of the big parts of this plan was putting it, viviana uh, yes. there last spring <laughs> it and is and um, and I will say when when we mutually agreed on that, um, <laughs> and we did. We did. We did. <laughs> One of the things I told her was to make sure if there's something she needs to let us know. Yeah. Because that that school is critical to our success, and we need to do that. And um, the it, Sam Houston, as some of you know, has a great tradition. And there are people who have been volunteering at Sam Houston for years and years and years, kind of a legacy. Mm -hmm. And church is involved, and uh, I think Viviana's in the phase of trying to figure out what's out there, putting together. I've been to, since you've been there, I've been to two different student celebrations yes. with mentors, and it's really a special thing. So mm -hmm. thank you for your support, and, and publicly, again, if there's anything you need, let us know. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank Great you, job, Mr. All right, we have had our discussion. And it's time to vote on. Do we need a motion to approve the. We actually yeah. moved and we had our second, so we've had discussion That's now. It is time for approval. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Motion thank passes. You. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Phillips, Ms. Harris, and all of your staff. Thank you very much. We appreciate all that you're doing. Um, item 4B, consider approval of the Texas Education Agency Technology Lending Program Grant. Mr. Caker, if you'll come present that item, please. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton, I'm here tonight to ask for your approval uh, for us to go forward with the Texas Education Agency Technology Lending Program Grant. Um, you have the information in front of you. It's a TEA grant. Um, we applied for it in 2014 and we're successful with um, that grant application. Um, at that time, the grant served Washington Junior High very effectively uh, in the area of math. Uh, what we are intending to do with this grant is go back to Washington Junior High following that plan and supporting students with technology and access to technology in their homes, which will also support the parent community as part of that work. And this year, uh, focus on English. Uh, language arts uh, and mainly on writing which aligns with uh, work we're doing in curriculum and instruction and specifically around seventh grade writing which as you know is an area that we're challenged with and um, so we are seeking your support 
the grant is a one hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant for one year and uh, there are no matching funds required so moved second all right any discussion questions all those in favor thank you very much thank you and I'll also like, excuse me, I'd like to point out too that that is the same feeder zone as Sam Houston Elementary School. Yes. <laughs> so that'll help. All right. Item 5A, consider approval of the 2018-19 school calendar. Okay, Dr. Null, if you'll present that item, please. Well, good evening once again. Um, <coughs> the school calendar is a process, you know, and, and we have our district level planning and decision making committee that works um, very, very diligently to put forth a good calendars for the public both to comment on and then for us to present to you. And I just want to kind of highlight the process once again. We start back in October um, and we, we, we begin the discussion, we get feedback from the board and, and we were able to, to put up in November two draft calendars for, on our website for the public to make comment on. Um, Ms. Blakelock does a great job of, of uh, creating a format on our website that I think is very user friendly. Uh, almost 3,000 comments this year came through. Um, and so that's very helpful for the committee. The committee actually met last week and we talked about the comments that came in. Um, we looked at the, not only the comments, but just the raw data of, we, you know, we kind of had a, a simple tally going for what people preferred of, of one draft over the other. And uh, with that, the district level committee was able to unanimously um, pick one of the calendars that they would put forth tonight for your approval. And that was draft two um, of the two that were up there. Uh, it received almost 60% of the total, if you want to call it a vote, but 60% um, <laughs> of the uh, responses were in favor of draft two. And just a few of the highlights of draft two, it's 177 days of instruction for students, 187 days for teachers. Um, early release day at the conclusion of each of our grading periods. First day of class for students is August 15th. That's the midweek start again as we did this year. We've, we discussed uh, last month the positive feedback. Uh, full week break at Thanksgiving. Winter break begins on December 20th. Spring break, uh, we did uh, also request feedback on spring break dates through our website. Um, the majority came back wanting the early the 11th to the 15th, and then since we put that up uh, during the process, more and more institutions released their spring breaks, and it turned out that that early spring break um, matched up with Lone Star College and Sam Houston, which are two that play a big role in our community and our families. Um, we have a holiday on April 19th, and then one uh, change from this year's calendar would be a holiday on April 22nd as well. Uh, last day of classes for students, May 30th. Uh, and then once again, just as our calendar this year um, does not include inclement weather days for students, we have enough minutes built into this calendar that if we were to have freezing days again, <laughs> um, yeah, that will never happen again, I'm sure, right? Um, but if that were to happen, we have enough minutes built in that we wouldn't have to ask our students to uh, make up a day. Wonderful. So happy to answer any questions. Um, oh, and, and then uh, in addition to the feedback from our uh, district level committee, we ask our principals which they prefer and unanimously our principals preferred draft two over draft one uh, as well. All right. Do we have a motion? I move that we accept draft two for school calendar 2018-2019. Second. All right. Any discussion questions for Dr. Knoll? I want to thank you for the work that the committee's done. I know that they spent a lot of time and y'all spent a lot of time compiling the 3,000 comments and, and getting all that ready for them. I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Yes, all those in favor. This is our new calendar for next year. Thank you. Thank you. Item 5B, consider approval of the guaranteed maximum price amendment for Austin Elementary additions and renovations and authorize the superintendent to execute contract documents. Dr. Stockton. Easy Foster, if you'll come present that item, please. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration and approval a guaranteed maximum price amendment. <coughs> for the Austin Elementary Additions and Renovations Project, and again, authorize Dr. Stockton to execute the contract documents. 
In February of 2017, we selected GTT Inc. as our district's construction manager at risk for our Austin Elementary project. Based on their proposal for this work, we have negotiated a guaranteed maximum price of $18,271,121. At this time, we're asking for your approval of the guaranteed maximum price. I'll move we approve as presented. Second. All right. Any discussion questions? Mr. Huskins. Um, you know, as the, as the economy rekindles and, you know, bricklayers decide they want more money for things and everything, budgets get, you know, and anytime you're rebuilding the school, you know, you run into surprises like that. It's not a clean new school so on a on a lot. But I just had a question about the budget trimming. You know, uh, you know, you came up with some ideas, or your team, that's just the team, came up with some ideas on idea on what to cut or what to pull back on or what to do. And and I just want to ask you because I don't know. Okay, I, I admit I don't know. But when you start taking layers of something out for $48,000, you know, we have contingencies in the bond. We have, you know, uh, we're blessed financially and so on and so forth. I just want to make sure that we're not going to regret. And I'm sure we're not. I I'm asking a question that I think I know, know what, how you're going to answer, but I don't feel good about not asking. So I just want you to tell me the things you cut out of that school are not making it less of a school than it needs to be that are not going to cost us on energy that are, you know, because I just soon give you the $48,000 another way or, or whatever. And I, I'm not going to argue with you because I don't know, but I do want to hear from you that those, those differences aren't going to make a difference. Well, and, and we're confident that the, the, uh, the, we call it value engineering on our side, which is really trying to squeeze the best value out of what we, what we've got. Our bid day quotes for everything that we dreamed that we could have wanted for Austin elementary were, about a million dollars higher than what we're looking at right now, um, a, a little bit more than that actually. If you recall, a couple of months ago, we bought a per or agreed to buy a purchase piece of land to help us uh, mitigate some of the unforeseen that we had when we planned this back in 2014, 2015, in preparation for our bond. Uh, we didn't anticipate having to redo the underground uh, utilities, so we've uh, in in the price that we're presenting tonight for approval, we are completely 180 degrees changing the drainage on this site, taking it to that pond, which we're uh, almost done with the investigation of buying that piece of land. Uh, and that is the buying the land, digging the pond was the least expensive way to, to do to handle the storm drainage. We've had, had a similar situation with the domestic water that serves that campus. City of Cut Chute doesn't have the capacity we need for the building we're gonna build. So we've had to do some infrastructure upgrades on the site in order to accommodate their small amount of water coming to our site. So you'll see a storage tank out there when we get when we're all done uh, to make that work. Uh, on the mechanical equipment, the things that really drive our energy budget uh, and our energy utility bills, uh, we're putting in the same equipment here that we're putting in the new flex schools, the new high mm -hmm. school. Uh, so we didn't actually skimp on the actual equipment that's going in. The things that actually turn and use energy, we're doing the right way. Uh, I'm confident that uh, the package we put up, uh, Marshall Schrader will be absolutely thrilled to uh, maintain that, uh, that equipment that we're putting in there. Uh, so the concessions we made were, generally speaking, cosmetic in nature. So we're building, a, uh, reorienting that building on that site, changing the parking lot, making it safer, uh, and but we're not taking away from anything where anybody's going to look at Austin Elementary and th think that we did them a, a, a disservice or they got second hand or everything they're getting is first class, first rate. Uh, for the price that we're putting in front of you tonight. Okay. Specifically, I just want to make sure, though, that I, I understand with, with regard to, I, I understand first rate in energy production, but, you know, we've spent millions of dollars replacing light bulbs and saved millions of dollars on energy. And, you know, when you start cutting, I can only assume that it's layers of either mm -hmm. soundproofing or, sound, or, or, or energy. I just want to make sure that you're telling me that the building's going to, the whole the heat and the air conditioning and 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 it was it was a little bit overkill maybe when you put everything you could dream you want and mm -hmm. you know and so on and so forth and you know I just I just want to make sure because you know forty eight thousand dollars now it had to go back later it's, it's two hundred forty eight thousand or two million or whatever absolutely no I'd stand behind this package just as I would our okay. new high school or any of the new elementary schools I just wanted to hear you tell me that good to go. <laughs> No. Okay. Anybody else? All right. All those in favor? 
motion passes. Um, item 5C, consider approval of the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the new junior high school in the Conroe Feeder Zone project. Dr. Stockton, Mr. Foster. <laughs> At this time, I'd bring forward for your consideration and approval a guaranteed maximum price amendment for a new junior high school in the Conroe High School feeder zone. In April of 2017, we selected Marshall Construction to be our construction manager at risk for this new junior high school project. This project also includes a 10 classroom addition at Irons Junior High. Based on Marshall Construction's proposal for this work, we've negotiated a guaranteed maximum price of $55,948,324. At this time, we're requesting your approval of the guaranteed maximum price. I'll move. So, so I second the motion. All right, any questions, discussion? All right, all those in favor? Motion passes item 5D, consider approval of the amendment to the design build contract for the life cycle replacement of stadium scoreboard systems project. Mr. Foster. At this time, we bring forward for your consideration and approval uh, an amendment to the design build contract for our life cycle replacement of our stadium scoreboard systems project. In October of 2017, we selected Dactronics to be our design builder for this project. This project includes the replacement of the school board systems at Buddy Moorhead Memorial Stadium, Wood Forest Bank Stadium, and inside our natatorium. On November the 20th, we entered into a contract with Dactronics on a design build basis. And since then, we've been working with Dactronics to come up with what we've wanted for our budget. And at this time, we're asking for a negotiated, or we're asking for approval for a negotiated stipulated sum price of $3,124,526. I ask Aaron Rice to provide a little additional information before. Yeah, you if I could just yes. give you all some uh, financial information, kind of the history of where we currently are, are with our current contract with Dectronics, and then what we are forecasting uh, for the new contract. Uh, under the current contract, we've generated a little over $4 million worth of revenue from advertisement sales. Uh, the total cost of that project, uh, this last project, was a little over $2.8 million. So that mm -hmm. $1.2 million difference through the contract has been split between Dactronics and CISD by a 68-32 percentage. We get 68% of that. So each year we get a little, a little bonus on those, on those revenues from those sales. Looking at the current contract and the current revenue stream that we're anticipating, we are, we're anticipating that the new scoreboards will be paid off in about eight and a half years. And that's about $415,000 a month worth of revenues coming in off of those um, I mean a year, I'm sorry, off, uh, off of those uh, school boards. What's the life expectancy? I mean, how long? Uh, our school board systems have been in place. This is their 10th season currently, so we would anticipate a similar lifespan for the next next round. You presented it as expense. You presented it as a profit center. So you can <laughs> <laughs> like We will <laughs> deal you can't pass out. Yeah, you can <laughs> a whole lot better life. <laughs> well, we want to make sure that, that and it, it is a money maker we'll go for us. I mean, it's making over 10% return on well, investment. I mean, you... Well, well they presented we, we really shouldn't be discussing until we put a motion and a second on the floor. So... Well, at this time, we're requesting your approval. <laughs> Thank you. A minute <laughs> to the contract for $3,124,526. Right. I'll second. Motion and a second. Now, go forward. <laughs> no, I'm good. You're I'm good? good. <laughs> <laughs> You liked Darren's sure. add in yeah. a little bit more than I mean, Mr. Easy's. Yeah, I appreciate that. Let's hurry up and vote so we don't miss anything. <laughs> all right. That was a good call. We're all good. All right. Motion to approve. All passes. Thank you both very much. Item 5E consider approval of architectural, engineering, and building commissioning service providers. Mr. Foster. Again, at this time, uh, bring forward for your consideration and approval a list of service providers for architectural engineering and building commissioning services. Uh, as part of a district our size, uh, we have an ongoing process of evaluating facilities, planning for future facility needs, uh, also planning for future construction. We published a request for, request for qualifications for an architectural engineering and building commissioning services. Uh, we advertise these uh, packages as we would any other construction project. Uh, we received qualification statements in December, and we received 19 responses <coughs> from various architectural engineering and uh, commissioning firms. 
Based on the Smithfield qualifications, in our, uh, we're recommending a pool of service providers. Um, so in the architectural category, we were recommending PBK Architects, Texas IBI Group, DLR Group, and VLK Architects. For MEP Engineering, we're uh, offering up PBK Architects, DBR Engineering Consultants, DLR Group, and CMTA Inc. In Building Commissioning, we're offering PBK Architects, DBR Engineering Consultants, DLR Group, CMTA Inc., and NV Engineering. Now, the firm selected, just because you're on the list, doesn't guarantee you're going to get any work out of us. We are just trying to create a pool uh, and a, that has an inclusive uh, or an all-inclusive area, so we have the serv service providers we need to look forward into the future and plan our work. This also gives us several options when negotiating on individual projects. Uh, we want to put the right vendor with the right project and the right team, especially when you throw building commissioning into it. If one firm designs it, they can't commission it, so we, we have to have a larger group so we don't so we can cross pollinate and get our and meet all the standards for the new codes. Each of these firms is actively involved in the K-12 market in the Houston area. Uh, each of them have uh, personnel and, and folks working for them that, that we are familiar with and understand their capabilities. We believe they represent the most highly qualified firms to perform the work for Conroe ISD, and we intend to negotiate fair and reasonable prices for projects individually as we move forward into the future. At this time, we request your approval of the pool. So moved. Thank you. Okay. Discussion questions, Mr. Husband. No. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I, I okay. do. Oh, I'm just going to have to say I'm going to have to abstain on the vote. Okay. Can make make that mark. Actually, I want to digress a little bit on the scoreboard. What's the salvage value of that? Or we, do we give those to the other districts? I know we own them based on the we, we've had them for X money. Do we give those away? What do we do with those? Well, we reserve the first right of refusal on all projects where we're dismantling equipment that is currently in operation. So what Dactronics has agreed is dis dismantle the current systems that are there, set them aside for us to kind of pick through and get the parts that we need from okay. our departments, and then whatever's left, they are going to recycle. Sorry, but I, I apologize. No on the, that was on my mind. Any questions yes, about I item have, 5E? And has the, or have the, has the law rules, whoever you want to say, changed? I don't ever remember commissioning. And we might have called it something different. Mm -hmm. We might have approved them. We approved architects at the first of a bond. We approved engineering firms and, and construction mm -hmm. managers at risk and G, general contractors and this and that and the other. But I've never remembered. So explain to me how the commissioning system is Certainly. come about. Uh, in, in years past, we've, we've done some different types of commissioning within the, the district. Uh, Marshall and his group did some retro commissioning going back into buildings to squeeze efficiencies out of them uh, in years past. Uh, we took those, those uh, that service provider we used for that, and we commissioned some of our other ugly projects where we did a lot of mechanical and uh, uh, air conditioning overhauls. Uh, when we got going on the, the new high school, we actually hired a third-party commissioning agent to look over that giant complex system because it's the largest one we built in over a decade. Um, now, since then, the energy code has, has changed and there was a statewide adoption of the energy code uh, IECC for 2016, I believe, if I have the numbers right. Uh, in November of 2016, it was adopted statewide. Uh, so it finally kind of caught up with us on our, uh, our flex school. So flex 18 is being third-party commissioning. If you remember back a couple of months ago, we had a, a pool to finish out our bond projects. And every project moving forward, all of our local municipalities have adopted the latest energy code. So our compliance pathway in that energy code requires a third-party commissioning agent, which is why we're trying to create that pool now. Okay, so I understand the commissioning agents, okay? But, you know, for example, we have a couple of architects that we using in this bond package, mm -hmm. right? It's predetermined, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I guess it could change. But anyway, so far, whatever, it's predetermined. But why are we uh, we're approving other architects? I mean, I understand the commissioning, but why are we approving other architectural firms? Well, because this is a, a much longer, longer, bigger picture item. So uh, we're nearing the end of our 2015 bond projects. As a yes. matter of fact, <laughs> after the next board meeting, we'll only have one left to approve. And then everything we told the voters we were going to do will be on the books and under contract. Yes. Uh, so now uh, it's time to take, take a step back and look at 
what does the future hold for us? Um, so we're always looking and always working with our maintenance department to see where the boogers are and where things are going to crop up on us so that we can be ready when things happen. So this is a, a team of folks that will be ready and available for us uh, as we move forward in the future for long-range capital planning as we figure out what our demographics are. If we sustain 2,000 students a year that has one, one growth pattern, if we go 1,500, that's a different growth okay, pattern. Okay, so let me ask the question differently. Are you asking me to prove some architects tonight that I'm not as familiar with as I am others? There are, are two. Are you asking me to prove them for, for potential use in the next bond, for example? Um, we don't want to presume the next bond, for example. But well, Okay, that, but I mean, if it were be, to pass, am I approving tonight people that would serve, that could potentially serve, or at least you decide and you bring it to me to vote on in that bond? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, this would be the team that we would plan that capital, that program with. Well, I'm not sure I'm ready to do that it, tonight. I mean, given, I mean, you know, I understood the commissioning part, but the hiring of engineering and architectural firms is on a total, totally different wavelength. Now, if they're, you know, I understand the commissioning of, of, of the of the HVAC, but I'm not sure that I'm prepared to, like I said, there's some people I'm familiar with and some people that I'm not, and I'm not, maybe that's my fault for not uh, having done more work, but I'm not sure I'm ready to approve that tonight. Do you have to have this for something? Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking for a table reason. Well, when it comes to planning, uh, time is our best friend. So the longer we put off putting a team together, the shorter time period we would have for right. something but, in the future. But if you didn't have new architects approved until next month, would it would it break the bank? No, sir. I mean, okay. by any means, I mean every, everything can be adjusted to I'm just, accommodate. Does I, I'm just there's just names on there that I'm not mm -hmm. familiar with, with all due respect, and and. What I wasn't sure that I was appro approving what I'm approving. I thought it was the commi I understood the commissioning thing to a, little, to a degree. That's the reason I asked the question, but I'm not sure that I'm, I'm in agreement with the rest. Am I understanding correctly, Mr. Foster? This doesn't limit us to only dealing with these as well. This no. is putting a pull together to start planning and to look at moving forward. But if we choose to use a different architect two years from now that's not on this list, mm -hmm. we are able to do that or a different um, engineering firm or anything along those lines. This is just having resources that we've looked at their qualifications that we can involve in our planning process. That doesn't mean they're guaranteed any work, mm -hmm. but it also doesn't mean that anyone else is excluded from that work. Is that correct? That is correct. And I know uh, Ms. Galatis could confirm for us by looking a little bit further in, the, in our own board policies and legal uh, uh, but the uh, the neat thing about architectures and in architects and engineers is we're not required to go through an RFU process at all. Right. We can select them on merit alone. So if there is a one-off project out there that somebody is just the perfect designer for, we can go right to them as long as we show that we've done the due diligence to make sure they were the right person. And this design. is doing the due diligence ahead of time so that if we have a smaller let's say $1 million project that we need someone to be involved in, we can go ahead and just move forward. Is yes. that? Yes. And I'm simply okay. saying that, the, and I'm, with all due respect, I'm simply well, saying that I haven't, I haven't vetted for myself mm -hmm. some of the names on that list. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a commissioning thing. And I'm saying to you that once you give him a list of architects or, or engineers and he brings a, uh, you know, CSM at risk, and this is the architect, and this is the engineering, and so on and so forth. It's a bigger deal to say no to it then than it is to do your homework up front. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm I just don't, I just haven't done my homework. Mr. Right, Husbands, my comments had nothing to do with your remarks. It was for my information. Okay. Well, Does I'm, anybody I'm, else have any other remarks or questions? And we have a, and we have all of the, all the data we collected. We'd be happy to share the mountain of material uh, with you. So, um, I'd like to do that, but I'd also like to uh, make a motion to table this until next month, so that I could do that. All right. If, if it's if it's all the same to anybody, do is we have a problem? Do we have a second on that motion to table? Seeing none. There is no tabling. Um, motion and a second to approve this list has been made. I move for a vote. All those in favor. All those opposed? And abstentions. 
All right, thank you very much. Item 5F, Received Capital Improvements Updates. Mr. Foster. At this time, it's my pleasure to bring you up to speed on what's been going on around the district with our capital improvements that are in progress. And I promise next month my list will be longer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take you to Grand Oaks High School. Grand Oaks is on schedule, scheduled to open in August of 2018. So you can see from the overhead view that everything is coming together nicely on the site. Uh, on the back end of our site, uh, we're making the connection to Waterbend Cove. That's the bridge deck that you're looking at there. So hopefully in the very near future, we'll be able to drive straight from Grand Oaks High School to Clark Intermediate and not have to go all the way around the mm -hmm. Grand Parkway to get there. <laughs> uh, on the inside of the building, the building's really starting to take its shape. So you're seeing the finishes, you're seeing things come down. This is a, a picture right down Main Street, just inside the front entry, looking towards the library and the dining commons area. Now you're looking at a, at a uh, visqueen wall at the end that separates the academic area from the fine arts, CTE, and athletics area at the back of the building. Uh, in our classrooms, you're seeing the, the colors and the cabinets and things of that nature coming together. The lights are on in the academic wing. The air is on in the academic wing. So that, that portion of the building is moving along just as we would expect it to. At Clark Intermediate, uh, it is in very much the same uh, schedule as Grand Oaks High School. It is uh, Clark Intermediate is scheduled to open in August of 2018 uh, at the same time as Grand Oaks. So you can see from the outside, the brick is working its way around the building. We're looking at a picture of the, uh, the mechanical yard. So it's the gymnasiums, the back end of the kitchen, things of that nature. This is the what we would consider the most difficult part of the building to work on. It's finishing first as they move towards the uh, common and academic areas. So on the inside of the building, what we're seeing is the development of the building systems. So you're looking at a shot of the kitchen, which is essentially ready for all the big equipment to come in and uh, be set in place uh, as we got the walls and all the infrastructure in place for it. Now on the other side, in the classroom end of the building, that's where the masons are working around to close that building in. But you can also see the building systems as they develop. So you're looking at the ductwork, the, the lighting circuitry, the conduits, the back boxes, things that are already up there, the fire sprinkler. Lots of the systems already in place waiting on the building to catch up to them. Moving over to Conroe High School, it's an addition and a renovation project where we're doing a classroom addition that will help us facilitate a major renovation of the main campus. Uh, that project is moving along very well. You can see the exterior framing of the building addition is moving along well. Uh, we've also recently set and installed the equipment inside the central plant. So this is the, the heartbeat of the new air conditioning upgrades that are going on that campus. So that project is on schedule as well and scheduled. We're scheduled to be on that campus through December of 2019. And that is our update. Mm -hmm. Mr. Foster. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Did, did the weather this week cause us any setbacks with ruptured pipes, damage to temperature sensitive equipment that was not enclosed, anything like that? Um, we didn't suffer anything on any job site that we didn't suffer as a district at whole. Uh, we were at Grand Oaks this morning when it was about 19 or 20 degrees. And we did have a ruptured backflow preventer there, but Marshall's been driving all over the district with his people <laughs> handling ruptured backflow preventers. The good news is the contractor is there on site to handle that one. Uh, so it doesn't cost us uh, any additional damages, and they're still paying for the water bill over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but other than that, uh, Clark did not have, we were there with that contractor day. It didn't have any, any temperature-related damages. Uh, Connor High School also did not suffer any temperature-related damages. So overall, construction-wise, we did, we did pretty well. Wonderful. We did have some pipes break throughout the district, but nothing that prevents us from having school tomorrow. But our, our maintenance folks were busy the last two days. You've gotten that remark in at least twice now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't wait by the phone. <laughs> All right. Item 6A, consider approval of the 2016-2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Dr. Stockton. Mr. Rice, please present that item. Yes, good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Stockton. It is my pleasure to recommend that the Board of Trustees approve the 2016-2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Now, a lot of work goes into putting this uh, financial report together, so I would like to recognize the finance staff that is here, Janice Towers and Karen Garza, for a good job. Uh, the CAPR was presented to the Audit Committee of the Board for their review and comments. The report was received favorably. The Audit Committee uh, is also recommending this for your approval. Sarah Roberts, partner with Weaver, and there are 
independent auditors uh, is here uh, to comment on the CAFR and to address any questions that you may have. Sarah. Hello, everybody. The type of audit that's applicable to the district is called a single audit. And a single audit, as some of you may know, um, uh, encompasses both the financial statements and um, the compliance aspects applicable to the district. Um, at the conclusion of our audit, we issue three reports, one report on the financial statements and two reports on compliance. I'm just going to run through those reports and just some highlights of the financial statements, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or discuss any specific topics that you'd like to hear about. The first report that we issue is our auditor's report on the financial statements. The final report isn't included in your draft, but I can just tell you that the audit, the opinion that we issued was an unmodified opinion, otherwise known as a clean opinion, which is the highest level of assurance that we, as professional auditors and CPAs, can express that the financial statements have no material misstatements. The financial statements of the district, um, which are, you can find starting on page 12, include um, government-wide financial statements as well as fund financial statements. The government-wide financial statements present a perspective of the district that encompasses all long-term assets, long-term <laughs> liabilities, uh, such as uh, buildings, vehicles, land, as well as um, general obligation bonds, pension liabilities, other long-term items like that. So the first financial statement is the government-wide statement of net position. And that shows that as of August 31st, 2017, the district had a total net position of approximately 155 million. And about 10% of that, or 15 million, was unrestricted. Moving forward to uh, the fund financial statements, which um, the, the focus on the, of the fund financial statements is on the current financial resources and current obligations of the district. So those long-term items I mentioned are excluded. Page 14, the governmental funds balance sheet shows that the general fund has total fund balance of about 134 million. And about 96% of that, or 130 million, is unassigned. Another highlight of the financial statements is the governmental fund statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance, which is similar to an income statement or statement of operations. On page 18, <clears throat> shows that the net change in fund balance of the general fund was a positive nine and a half million, and that's after transfers out of the general fund of 16 million. So the net change before transfers was a positive 25.5 million. And one thing I want to point out is that the, the unassigned fund balance that I mentioned previously of um, 130 million represents about 28% of the general funds expenditures for this um, preceding fiscal year. After the fund financial statements are the notes to the financial statements. The notes present some additional information, additional details and explanations on the financial statements. There were no new, um, significant new accounting policies adopted this last year. Um, no significant changes. Um, the other two reports that we issue are um, regarding compliance of the district, and those can be found towards the back of the comprehensive annual financial report. The first compliance report is what's called the Independent Auditor's Report on Internal Control over Financial Reporting and on Compliance and Other Matters, based on an audit of financial statements performed in accordance with government auditing standards. And this report describes the scope of our testing and the results. The bottom line of this report is that we found no um, material weaknesses in internal control and no instances of reportable noncompliance. The final report that we issue is titled um, the Independent Auditor's Report on Compliance for Each Major Federal Program and Report on Internal Control over Compliance Required by the Uniform Guidance. Uniform Guidance is what was formerly known as um, uh, OMB A133, for those of you that may be familiar. Uh, the major program of the district this last, this last fiscal year was Title I. Title I expenditures were about $7.2 million, or 22% of total federal expenditures. And in this, this final report, we again issue a clean opinion, an, an unmodified opinion on compliance. 
and that's it. So, any questions? I have a motion to approve the CAFR. Motion. So moved. I second the motion. Any discussion, questions for? Madam President, the only comment I'd like to make as chair of the audit committee is we uh, were very pleased with uh, Weaver and the work that they did. And again, just like to commend Mr. Rice and the entire finance team on a job well done. I've been involved with many boards where sometimes the audit doesn't come out as clean as this. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank and uh, applaud the hard work that went into making sure that our district has a financially very sound uh, plan and, and report, and also as far as compliance, that we are strong in that area as well. Yes. I would also say I, I don't think anyone on this board takes a clean audit for granted, and we are very, very grateful to Mr. Rice and his team. So. And, and also would like to also commend Kima Newton, mm -hmm. our own internal auditor, for her efforts as well. A lot of the work that Ms. Newton does helps out Weaver, uh, it, it, which substantially saves us some cost in the long run, which is a, a big savings for our taxpayers as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And I'm going to drop. All right. Mo motion and a second has been placed. All those in favor? Passes. Thank you. Uh, item 6B, receive final results on the new bonny bonds, series 2018. Mr. Rice, please. Yes, at this time I'd like to introduce Mr. John Roebuck, the district's financial advisor, to present the financial results from our 2018 series bond sale. Thank you, Mr. Rice. President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, good evening. Um, as board member husband has told me earlier today, it's a pleasure to come out here every time I have good news to report and, yeah. and no bad news. So this is, thanks, thank you for having me out tonight to give to the results of the, the 2018 bond sale. Uh, let me actually just push the button to turn or, oops, here we go. There we go. Uh, I'd like to start off by going over the current market review um, of the, the municipal bond market. Uh, this, this chart actually shows the municipal market as of the date of the sale, December 14th, 2017. Uh, the current bond buyer index at the time was a 3.41%. And to give you kind of some color about the market heading into the bond sale, if you recall in November we came out here and asked you to approve the parameter order, uh, there was talk about the new tax reform bill. Well, as we get closer to the decision of what they were going to put in that reform bill and, and what they're going to do to the municipal market, the markets kind of went a little volatile. They went a little crazy. Um, <laughs> They pulled out the ability to tax exempt refund or advance refund bonds. And so as a result, a lot of volume hit the market. And to give you some numbers, we usually average about $10 billion a month in volume in our, in our business. They were doing $70 to $20 billion a week during the month of December. So we entered, we entered the market near the tail end of, of that volume, but with your rating and uh, with your name and, and just right planning and a good underwriting team, uh, we, we knocked out of the park. And one of, one of the benefits of having a parameter order is that we had conversations leading into this, and, and Mr. Rice and I talked probably two weeks every day going into this, making sure that there's the right timing. Do we do it now or wait until January? You know, there's always a kind of a January effect where investors have money, but if, with this new tax bill, are they going to put it to use when they're going tax exempt bonds? Mm -hmm. So Mr. Rice made a decision to, to go forward on December 14th, mm -hmm. and as a result, Oops, there we go. This is the final source and uses of funds. Uh, we sold $174.4 million in bonds that generated a net premium, which means investors paid more for the bonds than par, of $28.8 million. Last year issuance expenses generates a total proceeds of $202 million. I apologize, I don't like to do this, but there's a typo on this slide. It was deposited to the construction fund, not to the escrow fund. Uh, this is for the projects that y'all discussed earlier tonight. Uh, the all-cost interest rate on the bonds was a 3.442%, and uh, the average life was 18.055 years. Uh, again, we sold December 14th, and we actually del delivered the bonds, and the district received the funds last Thursday on January 11th. This is the final debt service requirements. Uh, on the far left is your current requirements before the bond sale. And then plus the principal interest and total of the new 2018 unlimited tax school building bonds for your total debt service requirements on the far right. Uh, and then the schedule of events. I also want to point out 
with this sale, we, we finished the 2015 bond election. And just to, to give you all kudos and Mr. Rice kudos, you all completed the program well within what you told uh, taxpayers. And you were able to maintain the tax rate that you promised them, and you still continue to maintain that tax rate as you go forward the next couple of years. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'll be happy to answer your questions regarding the bond sale. I don't think there's any questions. Thank you. We love it when you come with good news. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robo. All right. Item 6C, consider award of RFP 17-01-01A. Mr. Rice. Yes, tonight I'm, I'm recommending that the Board of Trustees award RFP 17-01-01A contracted, contracted educational services, professional development, and educational consulting services, January 2018, to the 30 vendors listed on the attached tabulation for an estimated annual expenditure of approximately $10,000. Thus far, 190 vendors out of an estimated 350 have been awarded since June of 2017. This proposal will remain open until May 31st, 2018 for solicitations to be submitted. Service contracts with awarded vendors will remain firm through January 31st, 2019, with an option to renew annually for four additional one-year terms through January 31st, 2023. At this time, I recommend your approval. So moved. Second. All right. Any questions? All those in favor? Thank you, Mr. Thank Rice. You. The closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained in the notice of this meeting as authorized by section 551-0 or pardon me, point 072 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed session or executive meeting or session, then such final action, decision, or final vote shall be at either this public meeting upon the reconvening of this public meeting or at a subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof, as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. It is now 721. The board is now in open session at 746. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. We are adjourned at 746.